right. So today we're continuing in the Are You Covenanted? This is part three, the Are You Covenanted series. Now, I want to just kind of recap and re remind us of the definition of what we're talking about and also make a couple of quick kind of presetting points here. Okay, so we've been talking about covenant quite a little bit. We've had two parts of this. We have a definition that it's an agreement, usually formal. And I'm going to say scripturally, it's the most formal. Okay, you have promises that are made, and you've got agreements and other things that people have talked to each other and done. But then you have this thing called a covenant. So it is the, it's the most formal scripturally. And it's between two or more persons to do or not do something specific. And it's specified usually in that covenant. It's specified. This is what we're, the covenant is about, that you are either to do or not do something. Okay? So at its most basic level, a covenant is an oath-bound relationship between two or more parties. Marriage is an example of one of those. And so you can see how serious and how formal that would be and the level of commitment expected. And the idea that it's supposed to be a commitment for forever and that kind of thing is a part of that. As well as that we can see that the Creator uses covenants to establish a relationship between Him and his creation. And we saw with the flood that there was a sign with the rainbow, that it's a covenant that between him and all of his creation that he would never flood the earth again. Okay? When a covenant is between Yahweh and mankind, there are conditions attached to that oath on the human side. And if the human party involved in a covenant with Yahweh does not keep the covenant's conditions, there are consequences. We're going to read about that actually today, possibly. I'm not sure how, if we're going to get quite to those verses yet, but depending on how far we get today, either that or we'll get to it in the next part. There are some covenants that Yahweh makes to strengthen our confidence in his promises, and we've seen a little bit of that so far. And in these cases, Yahweh binds himself by his oath, by himself, by his own oath, to fulfill his promises that he made. So we've seen that quite a little bit with the things he said to uh, Noah, but we also saw it with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, where he talks about covenant in the form of formalizing and firming up confidence in his promises that he made to them. Okay, and we can see a link. And so, because people have asked, like, well, what's the difference between an oath and a promise and a covenant? Well, really, the level of formality of it and the obligations and consequences of them. Okay? And so, I mean, after all, I can promise you something and it obligates you uh, nothing. It obligates me. Okay, so a promise is a one-sided thing. Like you see Yahweh saying to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They weren't really obligated at all. He was obligating himself to them. I promise you that you and your seed are going to inherit this land someday. Okay, that you, Abraham, are going to be the father of many nations. He made promises that he didn't say if. He just said you're going to be. Okay, and so covenants generally have some expectation of specified performance, things that you're obligating yourself to do or not do. Sometimes the covenant expects you not to do some things. That's what we have, for example, in you know, what we call the 613 commandments, we have the, you know, the 248 positive and 365 negative commands. Okay, so you have expectations of do's and don'ts, right? All right, now, to kind of, we've already talked about this in the other two parts, so I want to kind of just clarify something on top of all that, which is, as we're looking at covenant, I know we talked about circumcision last time and some other things that are signs of covenant. I want us to understand, though, that we have to change our mindset to stop thinking like we've always thought, especially coming out of Christianity, like we're thinking about, well, I made an altar call, so now I'm in the club, so to speak, or I'm saved, or I'm this, or I'm that, or I've done some other, you know, the sinner's prayer, whatever you did, okay, I don't know what you did, or you got, you know, baptized. These are, none of these things are covenantal, okay? There's no covenant that says, to covenant, the sign of the covenant is saying the sinner's prayer, or making an altar call, or getting wet, that doesn't mean they're not part of something and important elements of something, but when we're dealing with this idea of covenant, we have to be able to make sure we're clarifying and separating in our minds what is what. And so, because I know some people got confused, some people even got upset when I said, look, getting baptized didn't covenant you. What you were doing was you were making public declarations of a commitment and obligating yourself to your creator as part of your citizenship changes, right? Because really, the way I've given it to you as part of the, you know, the mikvah, the immersion, is the declarations are all about a changing of status and citizenship 
Now, the covenant, let's make sure we're following this, is an obligation on those that have that status. The mikvah is the changing of status. Can you see the difference? You understand? In other words, the covenant is between Yahweh and who? Israel. Now, we're going to get there in Exodus here today, hopefully. All right? So the covenant that we're going to see is eventually going to get to, it's gone through sort of a process, working our way towards Moses. And we get to Moses and Sinai, the covenant is going to be between Yahweh and Israel and those that would attach, join, graft in, whatever word you like, doesn't matter, become Israel. What you did at the mikvah is you went in the water, a Gentile, and came out committing to be an Israelite to which now you are grafting into an existing covenant. Although the water itself is not a covenant. You now have to go ahead and commit yourself to keep that. You, but you've obligated yourself now under that covenant. Hopefully that makes sense to everyone. But the water wasn't a sign of the covenant. He never has a verse that says, as a sign of the covenant, you're going to go in the water. He does say that circumcision is a sign of the covenant. We're going to see in Exodus that Sabbath keeping is a sign of the covenant. Okay, I hope maybe we got that, you know, might get to that today. And so I just want to make sure that we are ready to accept what the book says, which means it's what our creator said. Hopefully we all understand that what we're reading, it came from him. That what it says is limited to what it says. Not what we've always been taught, not what we've always felt or understood, but what it actually says. And that's hopefully one of the reasons why you feel comfortable and, 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 and drawn to this particular ministry is because we try to stick to just what it says. And we read a lot of verses so that you absolutely know what it says. Okay? So that clarification I felt was necessary because I know for some people there was some confusion because I know a lot of people out there came to this, especially out of Christianity, not feeling like they needed to have, actually go and get circumcised anymore. That somehow that wasn't a piece of this. And I've actually spoke to a few people in the last day or so who are now realizing, you know what, I think I need to do this. Now, as an adult male, that's a tough conversation. And I, hey, look, at eight days old, no problem. You're not going to remember it. You don't know it when it's happening. And no big deal. You know, 18, 20, 30, 50, 60, whatever you are, whole different story. Okay. Because we've learned through our lives as men to be very protective of that area. Listen, you've ever fallen down and hit it or gotten kicked in it or whatever, it's, you know, you, you get protected. That's what you just taught as a boy. And now here, all of a sudden, now you're going to have to let someone take a knife? I mean, I'm trying to be honest. But I, I'm sorry if it's too blunt, but that's a big decision. Ladies, you know, you have to understand that is just, because some of you are thinking, well, I need my husband just to go ahead and get circumcised. Well, put yourself in his shoes for five seconds. What part of you is going to have to get cut off surgically as part of what you're doing? Nothing. Have some empathy and sympathy for how, you know, that's, a not, that's not an easy decision. I praise Abba, I didn't have to make that choice. I'd like to believe I wouldn't hesitate to make that choice. But I haven't had to do it. So how do you know until you put in that place, right? But I'd like to believe I wouldn't hesitate, but I didn't, I didn't have to make that choice. My parents, who were raised in a Jewish community, had me circumcised on the eighth day like all other Jewish boys. Okay, but let's understand that the things that the church told you and the things that the church had you doing are not necessarily covenantal or signs of you being in covenant or obligations of covenant. Because quite frankly, you were taught that there was an old covenant that was for them and then and dispensationally not for us now and a new one which is all different with different obligations and whatever. And so you probably weren't taught about the actual, what we'd call the covenant. And there's lots of covenants we're going to read about. But the covenant that we talk about as far as relationship with the Father and the Son leading into the kingdom life forever, that covenant is going to be renewed according to Jeremiah 31. Not a whole brand new one brought into place. But the reason it's called new is because, guess what? The other one was broken, so we need a new one. Okay, if you and I have a contract and one of us breaks it, we can choose to, re to go ahead and write a new one. But we're going to need to write a new one after the first one was broken because that one's no longer valid. It was broken. 
But that doesn't mean we have to change the agreement. If Nate and I have an agreement, we don't have to change the agreement. We can go ahead and go ahead and say, okay, let's put that agreement back in place. We've made our apologies. We, we tried to set things straight. We restored whatever had to be restored. Let's put that agreement back in place. That's what Jeremiah is talking about. That's what's, because he says, who does it say? Well, let's, you know what? We're not supposed to get there yet, but let's just go there real quickly. Jeremiah 31. Okay, I'm just going to read a part of this. We're not going to go through the whole thing to clarify everything going on in 31, but I just want you to catch a couple of quick, important points because it fits into everything I just said. In verse 31, it says, See that, and by the way, that's one of those ones you should have no problem remembering because it's 3131, okay? And in 31, it says, See the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I shall make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Well, it doesn't say the church. Or the Gentiles? So whenever anybody's talking about being in the new covenant now, they are, I haven't heard a church yet say that they're not referring back to Jeremiah 31. But nowhere in Jeremiah's writings is he talking about anybody except Israel and Judah. And actually, when you scroll down to verse 33, he doesn't mention Judah anymore because they're coming back together as we see in Ezekiel. And when you see the two sticks coming back together. Okay, and that's in Ezekiel 37, or whatever it is, right? Okay? So then it says in verse 33, For this is the covenant I shall make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. Oh, because in verse 32 he says, I, I have to make a new one because they broke the old one. My covenant which they broke. It's at the latter part of verse 32. I'm not going to break this all down. We're going to get to it when we get to Jeremiah. We're kind of chronologically going through this. But understand... You were told all this stuff from a Gentile, Christian, other sort of dispensational point of view. You're going to have to totally scrap all that and relearn what covenant is and who it's with and how it works. And so what we're talking about here is a covenant between Yahweh and the house of Israel and the house of Judah, which become back together as one. Okay, I know there's a big debate out there about whether there's two houses or one house. Well, look, right now and has been since the splitting of the kingdom, so to speak, when you have the northern kingdom and the southern, the Israel and Judah, there has always been two, and it's always been prophesied that they would be brought back into one. So there really should be no argument over this. One house, two house. Well, always supposed to be one. He allowed it to become two. Go listen to the teaching on discovering your identity, and it will once again become one. And you see that in Ezekiel 37, when the two sticks come together, which, you know, you got to remember, you can't just read a prophet and not link all the other stuff that's happening that's connected to it. So what's happening here in Jeremiah 31 is referring to what's happening in Ezekiel 37. In this process of making a new covenant, the two sticks have come back together. And in Ezekiel 37, we're told, and they will have one king. That's what we're talking about in the future, and that's what's coming. But it's all going to be based on what? covenanting. So we're hopefully we're going to stop with this, oh, I was saved back in this day, and I was saved in that day, or oh, he's a believer, and I'm a believer. You know, all of a sudden we're going to sing the monkey song, you know. I'm a believer. Okay. All right. Always like that song. A little high for me, but you know. But I always like Davey because I like not being picked on for being short, so. And that was always his line. You don't have to pick on me because I'm short, you know. But let's remember what it really is all about is coming into a contractual obligation relationship known as covenant. And we're going to read about that today. Hopefully we get to Exodus 19. But in Exodus 19, you're all familiar. I've said this like every teaching we talk about it almost. You know, there was a contract that said, if you agree to do everything I say, I agree. And we're going to do this on a level, not as a promise, not as an oath, not as, we're going to call it a covenant. We're going to have a covenant between us. And that covenant is going to be a, a relationship of you do what I say, and I take care of all of everything you ever could possibly need. And so the only status or relationship that we should be looking for is being covenanted. Are you covenanted? Not are you saved, or are you a believer, are you this or that, but are you covenanted? Are you signed on to that contract? A legal contract between you and your creator. 
Just like someone says, I'm married. Most people know what that means. It's a legal contract between a husband and a wife. And so if you say you're married, most people know what that means. Problem is, if you say you're covenanted, nobody knows what that means. Because it's not commonly taught. It's not commonly understood. It's not commonly explored and dealt with. I mean, how many of you had a covenanted conversation in any of the churches you've ever been in? Except for the dispensational idea of that was the old one and this is the new one. I'm not talking about that. All of you heard that one. But nobody was taught, were you? I, even in all of my experiences, I don't remember hearing a sermon on being covenanted. So I'm glad Marty said, why don't we do a teaching on that? Because we need one. Because that's really what it's going to come down to. All right? And I think that's actually what the wheat and the tares kind of have to do with. The wheat are those that are actually going to keep their obligations and be part of the covenant. And the tares kind of looked like they were part of it or maybe said they, that they were part of it, but really weren't. Okay? And it has to do with what? The expectation of performance. Okay? If I have a contract with, you know, with uh, Daniel, and Daniel does flooring, and I have a contract, I expect him to put in whatever type of flooring we agree to, a hardwood floor, this color, this type, whatever. He is obligated. I'm expecting him to perform. He's expecting me to pay him. Right? That's our contract. Okay, I'm expecting him. Now, if he doesn't put in the floor and not the way I want it and what I asked for, then I'm probably not going to want to pay him. Okay, so there's a specified expectation of performance of things to do and things not to do. And so we have that kind of thing going actually on with our creator. And it's really not really that complicated. It's very simple. We agree to trust that he knows everything and loves us so much that we can do nothing we need to do but trust him completely. So everything he says to do, if we do it, we should be great. If he says not to do it and we don't do it, we should be great. And we trust that he'll take care of every need if we do that. That's the relationship. See, most of you said, I do, at an altar somewhere to a spouse. And you know what? You had no idea what you were getting into. Why? Because there's no classes about it. And you didn't know what, you know, your spouse expected out of you, but you didn't know what they were expecting from you. And you expected from your spouse, and they didn't know what you expected of them. By the way, if you counsel with me now to get married, I make you do that. I make you sit down and have a conversation about what it is that you think and what you expect out of the other person. So you guys remember that conversation, okay? It made a difference, didn't it? Okay, because... When I got married to my wife, I had a very clear picture, somewhat in my idea, in my head, whatever, of what I thought a wife was going to be like. She had an idea of what a husband was going to be like. She also had an idea of what a wife would be like, and I had an idea of what a husband would be like. Guess what? They didn't match. But nobody's does, so don't laugh at us necessarily. Some of you are laughing because you remember when you got married, it turned out to be the same thing. But nobody talked about talking about that before you get married. See, we have a book, and we have teachers... And we have people that we talk to to find out what it is you're getting into. This is not like get all emotionally excited and make an altar call. And then you have no idea what you're getting into. I told you that story about how I was at that one place where they were about to do an altar call. They brought all the youth pastors and all the pastors in the back room. And they said, we're about to do an altar call. And all these young people here are going to have no idea what they just did. And I wanted to scream them, why in the world would we do it? What would be the point? What is the point of getting them to do something they have no idea what they did? It seems insane, ludicrous. Because somehow it's important that we just get them to do it because then we could put it on our books. Hey, we did this, you know, we saved so many people. You can't save anybody. Salvation comes from father, son, not from us. But yet... You know, we're not told that there's an expectation. See, when I got married and had my expectation, she had her expectation, and we hadn't talked about it. Well, guess what? When we got married, we came to find out we didn't have the same expectations, and we had to work those things through, as all couples have to do, right? Well, the father expects us to know what we're getting into and understand our obligations. And that's why he says it's not a complicated, deep contract. You know what? When you do your vows at a wedding, even if you do the standard vows, it's like sickness and health and this and that. And all, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Fathers is very simple. You do everything I say, and I'll take care of everything. That's the whole contract. You obey diligently everything I tell you to do and not do, and I'll take care of everything. 
Our, our wedding vows are more complicated. I mean, I don't think there's any contract on, on the planet that's less complicated than that contract. It's the most simplest contract there is. And he calls it a covenant because of the level of seriousness of it and the obligations. And covenant also, that there's an expectation. And what we read in my little notes in the front here was that there's going to be consequences. See, I don't know how you do it. I'm not a doormat. I'm at a restaurant. If I don't get good service and I don't get good food, the consequence is I'm not going to be giving a good tip. Perform now, I'll tell you the other side of it. If you make my, my experience a pleasure and seamless and awesome, and I don't have to worry about anything, to, and I'm not even thinking about, I wonder where my waitress or waiter is to take care of my drink, because it's always being refilled, I'm going to give you an awesome tip. I'm a very good tipper. But I'm also going to, if you don't take care of what I, it's a contract to some degree. It's an expectation. There are consequences, right? Well, at least there should be. And so let's really understand, before we even get into any of the verses, I want to make sure we're getting our mindset right on what we're talking about. This is not what you've been taught before. You cannot compare this to the things that you've done before, experienced before, because you haven't been shown this before. This is what is the relationship, because I know you know this, because don't almost all of us think about leading this all the way through our life to a thing called a wedding? The wedding of the lamb, the wedding feast, the thing at the end. Isn't that what we've all been taught? Even in Christianity, right? You were taught about looking forward to that. Isn't that a covenantal relationship? And shouldn't we, like I teach you, like I said, I think my wife and I didn't do this. None of you probably did this except those who've counseled with me. Shouldn't we know going in that what the bridegroom expects of the bride and what the bride expects of the bridegroom and all the different obligations and what that relationship is? I mean, all of you, male or female, we're part of the bride, right? But do you understand what it means to be a bride? Especially the guys. Actually, I shouldn't even say especially the guys. A lot of you ladies have no idea how to be a bride. I'm not picking on you. You just don't. But you weren't ever taught it. You don't have examples of it. You've never seen it done right. And, you know, and so here we have a relationship. But we also have to understand the relationship that the bridegroom was going, it was the husband what is, what's our relationship supposed to be in terms of respect for that, authority for that, submission to that? So we're going into this relationship. So some of us like to think, well, I'm in the covenant, I'm a covenant person. Well, but we're also heading to another renewal of those vows at the wedding ceremony. When the bride and the bridegroom come together, when Yeshua returns. And so there's going to be, again, a covenant I don't, I don't think for one second, by the way, that the covenant will be any different than what Jeremiah is talking about. Because Jeremiah is not talking about changing that covenant. Now, he is saying here in verse 32 that it's not going to be like the one he made with their fathers in, the, in terms of when the fathers broke it. He says this one everybody's going to keep. Not because the covenant's different, but because people will be different. Can we be clear on that? The covenant itself won't be different. Because, you know, Christianity wants you to believe that the problem with everything is that the Torah was too tough. And so we kept getting into problems because we couldn't possibly keep it. So we got to do away with all that stuff to make it easier for us. Because clearly Torah is the problem. Not us. We're not. We can't be the problem. So, you know what? Even if you can't come to the point where through this teaching and your commitments that you really feel like you're covenanted, guess what? You're still going to be at another place called the wedding feast and you're going to make another covenant. You're going to make vows. We're going to have a ceremony. I don't know what that's going to look like. And so we're going to be reaffirming our covenanting in terms of a forever as you get changed into the incorruptible and make those commitments. I don't know. I have any idea what that's going to look like. But we're all looking forward to it, aren't you? So I know that's a long-winded way, 25 minutes to kind of lead into this. But I think we need to make sure we're clear. This is just not another interesting teaching where we're going to take a word, study, and go through what covenant is and kind of just study through this. This is everything on some levels, okay? This defines the relationship between us and him and also us with each other because in that obligation to him, he wants us to treat each other a certain way as part of those obligations. So how I treat you is also part of my covenant with him. That's why we're told the two great commands, right? What are the two greatest commands? Loving him and loving each other. 
which, by the way, is very detailed and explicitly and expressed in the Torah. The commandments tell us about how to treat each other and how to treat him. With the expectation is that he said it, we do it. That's it. It's not complicated. I mean, he might be the only one that exists that, I, because I said so, should really count. <laughs> there can't be any arguing. It's because I said so. The reason we fight against the because I said so some human beings is because we don't trust that they're right. Can we agree on that? Some of you still don't trust that he's right. Be honest. Think, look in yourself. Look inside. Some of you still are making choices and decisions because you're not ready to trust that he's right. Not just that, but that he's always right. That's what we call emunah. Emunah is that full faith, trust, belief, that fullness of the depth that he is always right. And that he's always in charge, that he's always in control, and that everything that happens, happens because he allows it or causes it. But some of us are still struggling against because we're not ready to trust that he's right. And that's the only reason why we don't like the I told, you know, because I said so. And all of you have probably had a parent do that to you at some point. And then you became a parent and you did to your kids. And you swore you'd never do that. And then you almost want to bite your tongue the first time it came out of your mouth. Ah, I can't believe I just said that. But what are you really saying with because I said so? I can't explain this to you right now. I'm tired of arguing with you. You need to just trust me. Isn't that really what you're saying? But the problem is your kids don't believe you're always right either. And that's why they don't do it to you just like you didn't do it to your parents. Because you can't really trust and believe that they're always right. Well, you know what? Human beings aren't always right. And then if we act the same way towards our creator, now we have a problem. Because he is always right. And it's a hard thing to change our mindset and our heart in dealing with him to know that we can't deal with him like we deal with each other. Because we want to argue with each other. You can't argue with him. Stop arguing with him. Stop trying to debate him or try to weasel around or find a side door or whatever, spin or whatever you're trying to do. You know, he said it, that's it, done, do it, that's it. Or he said it, don't do it because he said don't do it, that's it, no arguing. That's, take the circumcision. I know everybody wants to try to find somewhere, some verse that defends not doing it, that's ridiculous. Stop arguing, just do it. If you can, if you have a health issue, we talked about it. There's only a few people out there that can't. If you can't, can't is different than won't. You're always trying to figure out if you've got a can't or won't problem. Okay, let's just make sure. That's a long lead into this, but that was probably more important than anything I'm going to cover after this. Okay? That you have to understand what we're talking about in terms of being covenanted. All of us got excited about wiping away tears and peace and shalom in our lives and healing for our injuries and in our relationships and, and living forever and not having to, you know, think about just this scary nothingness of death, but there's a, there's a thing that comes after that. And we're all excited about all those things, but we're not really that excited to really understand what gets you there. And it was so easy, though, to come in through a Christianity mindset, and some of you still, unfortunately, won't let all of that go, of it being an easy road. It's just that easy, you make your sinner's prayer, you do your altar call, that's it. Not that I'm, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but more or less, that's it. Whereas he's expecting you to completely work on you, to change and transform. Not that Christianity never doesn't say that, they do, but they just don't explain what that looks like. Because it looks like becoming Torah observant, submitted to commandments, following instructions. That's the transformation. That's why we talk about it. It's on all of our t-shirts right on the back. It says, Torah, what? Blesses you, keeps you safe, and transforms you. It's the vehicle that transforms you from what you are to what he is. That's the transformation. But it, and it, it comes through covenanting with him. In the covenant, you're basically saying, I trust that you're always right, and so I should do everything you say. I trust that you're always right, and I should not do anything you say not to do. And I trust that if I do that, 
I'll be blessed, I'll be safe, I'll be transformed. That's, this is not really that complicated, you know? But man has made it complicated because man has confused it, convoluted it, done away with things. I mean, you know, I think I lost the mic there. Man has messed it up, convoluted it, confused it, you know, rearranged it. It's like taking a beautiful picture. Imagine taking, going to someone's house and the puzzle is already done. What does man do? Comes in and starts throwing it up in the air and throwing it into the box and scattering pieces everywhere. Even though the picture was already done, it was beautiful and it was all put together. And the way man throws it around, he's like, well, we don't really need all of these pieces. Let's throw them. Well, they're never going to make the picture again. <laughs> you know? But I don't like the whatever colored pieces or this shape piece or whatever it is. So you just throw them all out. I don't like the straight edges. Let's just throw them all out. Well, it's not gonna, you're not going to end up with the right picture. You know? I don't like pieces that have, like, you know, only, only holes in it. There are no knobs on it. Okay, we'll get rid of all those pieces. Or I don't like, you know, see how absurd that is? You're never going to get the picture. All right, let's actually go back to the book here. Genesis, Bray Sheet 28. That was my half-hour intro. By the way, my ulterior motive for all of that, I'm just making this up and kidding here. It's sarcasm, but it's so I can make sure I have enough of this to do all the way through Sukkot, so I'm stalling. Okay. I'm kidding. That was a joke. Because we are not going to get anywhere through what I want to today. But I think that we needed to do this. I was thinking about it before we started. We ha Did that help? Okay. I needed to make sure we were clear in understanding the difference between this and whatever else you've experienced. And also the difference between this and what you thought it was. Oh, lost it again for a second there. Okay. The difference between this and what you thought it was. Because some of you did have some sort of an idea of what covenant was before you got into this you know, teaching series. And, you, you know, hopefully you're starting to see that it may or may not have been exactly what you thought it was. All right. Remember I used the marriage thing. How many of you, when you finally, in whatever marriage experience you had, found out that not very long after you got off that, you know, out from under that, you know, altar or whatever, you know, the chuppah, wherever you were, and you were married now, how many of you did it take very long for you to realize it wasn't exactly what you thought it was? Didn't take long, did it? Okay? Some, sometimes in good ways, like there were things that was better than you thought it was. But I'm saying it didn't take long to realize that whatever you thought it was, it wasn't exactly what you thought it was. And I don't necessarily mean that in a disappointing, bad way. I'm just saying there's, sometimes there's no way to know until you actually are there, or unless you had somebody who's been there literally walk you through it in a right way, which none of us gets that experience. You know? We're mostly worried about if mom or dad approves because of whatever reason they like somebody or don't like somebody. You know? Or maybe we're doing it because we purposely want them not to approve and we're being rebellious. And we want somebody that mom or dad's going to hate. <laughs> That's, plenty of people have done that too. You know, what a dumb way to commit yourself for a life sentence because you want to piss off mom and dad. People do that though, you know. And so I think we'd like to go into this with our eyes wide open, with our hearts and, and brains and everything wide open and, and, and seeing what it really is that we're committing to and then making a rational, logical choice and decision. Go back to the teaching. Making decisions is the reason you exist. Okay. Genesis 28. And we're finishing up here with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In Genesis 28, we're going to read verses 1 through 4. <coughs> Excuse me. And Yitzhak called Yaakov and blessed him and commanded him and said to him, Do not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padamaran, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take a wife for yourself from there, and the daughters of Lavan, your mother's brother. And El Shaddai bless you and make you bear fruit and increase you, and you shall become an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and to your seed with you, so that you inherit the land of your sojournings, which Elohim gave to Abraham. So Yitzhak, uh, so that was up to verse 4. So now we see the promises being passed on. Remember, we're talking about promises. We're also talking about covenants, right? So here we see the promises in this statement where Yitzhak is passing things on to Yaakov. Is Yaakov being obligated to anything other than going to the place he was sent to go to take a wife? And by the way, it doesn't say, if you don't go, I'm not giving you these places. It says, El Shaddai bless you and make you all take these promises. These are promises still. Go to verse 13. We'll stay in the same chapter. And see, Yahweh stood above it and said, I am Yahweh, Elohim of Avraham, your father. 
and the Elohim of Yitzchak, the land on which you are lying, I give it to you and your seed. And your seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall break forth to the west and the east, to the north and the south, and all the clans of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your seed. And see, I am with you and shall guard you wherever you go, and shall bring you back to this land, for I am not going to leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. So again, is this a covenantal thing or a promise? This is the promises. Same promises made from Abraham, Isaac, to Jacob. Okay? Go to Exodus chapter 2 now. Okay, we're going to take those whole promises and see how that starts to play forth into Israel and their journey in Egypt. Okay, Exodus chapter 2. We'll see how this all connects. And we're going to begin in verse 23. Okay? And it came to be after many days that the sovereign of Israel died, and the children of Israel groaned because of the slavery, and they cried out, and their cry came up to Elohim because of the slavery. Listen now. And Elohim heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And Elohim looked on the children of Israel, and Elohim knew. So what covenant did he make with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Well, there was a covenant in Genesis 15 where he says in verse 13, and we read this in part one or two, in Genesis 15 and in verse 13 it says, and he said to Abram, know for certain that your seed are to be sojourners in a land that is not theirs. I shall serve them and they shall afflict them for 400 years. But the nation whom they serve, I am going to judge, and afterward let them come out with great possessions. And then verse 18, it says, And on that same day, Yahweh made a covenant with Abram. So there was a covenant, but the covenant was about what, specifically? Bringing the people out of their sojournings, out of the land, not their own. Now, there were promises also made, but they weren't necessarily part of that covenant. He covenanted to bring them out. So he says, Elohim heard their groanings and remembered the covenant, which I'm sure Abraham passed that on to Isaac and to Jacob to know that there would be a time where they would be slaves in a land not their own and that he would then redeem them out of there. So see that connection between Genesis 15, verses 13 to 16 and verse 18, and Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 to 25. And so we see this covenanting that was going on. That was the covenant of the pieces back in, in Genesis, where you know, it was a covenant that Yahweh made, and Abram didn't have to do anything. But he obligated himself. Remember we read that, that sometimes there are covenants that Yahweh makes to strengthen our confidence in his promises. And in those cases, he binds himself by his own oath. And here we see, which is wonderful when you're reading scripture, to see something that was promised and made in covenant as, as an oath, etc., then actually happening. Then actually happening. Here we see this is the fulfillment of Genesis 15. They have been in the slavery situation in a land not their own. And so now he says he remembered, he heard their groanings, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Go to chapter 6. We'll stay in Exodus here. Okay, so part of the reason why you saw me go through all of that stuff with the promises is to get us to that verse there in chapter 2. Because you know about the promises now, and you know about what, what, what Yahweh did with Avram, and so now we see it playing out. So in some ways, he was saying now he was going to fulfill that promise to bring them out. Now, what was the covenant? To bring them back to the land. So that covenant had not yet been completely fulfilled until he brought him back to the land. Ultimately, we still haven't fulfilled it because we're all not ultimately back at the land. Because he then makes more in the covenant when he talks to Moses. He talks about how, and they're going to screw this whole thing up after I go through all this process with them. And they're also going to get scattered to the four winds and the four corners, etc. And I'm going to have to gather them up from where I scattered them and bring them back to the land. So we're going to see this play out again. Exodus 6 and verse 1. In Exodus 6, verse 1, and Yahweh said to Moshe, now see what I do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he is going to let them go, and with a strong hand he is going to drive them out of his land. And Elohim spoke to Moshe and said to him, I am Yahweh. Now hold on a second. Now and back in um, chapter 15 of Genesis, what does it say in verse 14? It says, I'm, the, I'm going to judge them and let them go. I'm going to judge them. They're going to be signs. I'm going to, I'm going to do things. I'm going to have judgments. So he actually says also in Genesis 15, 15, which is why later we're going to see that Egypt is going to see and receive my judgments. Okay? So in verse 1 he says, look, see what I do to Pharaoh. And with a strong hand I'm going to do. 
and I'm going to drive you out. I'm going to take take you and he's going to uh, Pharaoh's going to drive them out of his land, the Israelites. And Elohim spoke to Moshe and said to him, "I am Yahweh." Now we're going to see a lot. In, and especially we see this in Leviticus chapters like 16, 17, 18, 19, like that. We see there are a lot of places where Yahweh likes to go through a process of making sure you know who you're talking to. And you, anybody have this like, because I'm your father, or your mother goes, because I'm your mother, in case you forgot. <laughs> like somehow that was a question and a doubt in your head. Okay? But Yahweh's saying, look, just in case anything's not clear, I am the creator. And so when I say it, you're supposed to trust it fully and know it's absolutely going to happen. He says, and I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as El Shaddai. We read that a little bit also, which is part of why we read chapter 28. Because what was Isaac's you know, prayer? El Shaddai bless you. Okay? He said, and by name Yahweh was I not known to them. And I also established my covenant with them. Ah, there's that word covenant. So there was a covenant with them. To give them the land of Canaan, the land of their sojournings in which they have sojourned. That was the covenant, to give them the land. But he also told Avram, before he became Abraham, that as a part of this deal, your descendants are going to be slaves in a land not their own. That's going to happen. He says, and I have also heard their groaning of the children of Israel whom the Mitzrites are enslaved. And I have remembered my covenant. What was the covenant? Not the promises he made to Abraham. I think those are promises. His covenant was to bring their descendants back to the land. That was his covenant. Now, he did promise as a part of all of that to get that all to play through. Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And then he says to J here, uh, Isaac says to Jacob that you're going to be, uh, all these peoples are going to come forth from you, etc. So they're all part of that plan. But what is the covenant? that through that relationship, I'm going to take them, all of that group, all those people that would eventually come out of that, all of those promises, and bring them back to the land. He says, verse 6. How far do I want to go? Verse 8. Okay. Say, therefore, to the children of Israel. Now, these are where we get the four cups from that we usually use during Passover. I am Yahweh, and I shall bring you out from under the burdens of the Mitrites, and shall deliver you from their enslaving, and shall redeem you with an outstretched arm, and with great judgments, and shall take you as my people, and I shall be your Elohim. And you shall know that I am Yahweh, your Elohim, who is bringing you out from under the burdens of the Mitrites. And I shall bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give it to you as an inheritance. I am Yahweh. Now, let's remember, one of the, what are the things that are going on here in these verses? First of all, he doesn't mention the covenant here at this point. We're going to see that happen in Exodus 19. But he is telling you, I'm making these promises that are going to lead to that covenant thing. And in this process, he's saying that you are going to, all this is going to happen for what reason? So that you know who I am. Remember what knowing, what is knowing? A relationship. It's not informational, it's relational, right? We've got little, you know, quotes that I've said like that out and, you know, little graphics and things. Knowing is relational, not informational, and he says here, he says, look, I'm going to do all these things and take you as my people, and you shall know that it is I, I, Yahweh, who is bringing you out of this. I'm the one. So in your life, the same thing. He did all that he did for you so that you would know that he did it. But then do we act like we actually know that? Well, in the initial point we do, oh, we're all excited when he delivers us out of stuff and intervenes and makes all these wonderful miracles happen in our life, and we're so excited about it, but then we forget so quickly. Any different than Israel coming out of Egypt? Nope. Oh, but we laugh and mock them like how dumb they were. I can't believe that they were out of Egypt five minutes and already they're whining about being hungry, or they're whining about being thirsty, or they're whining about this, or they're whining about that. Are you any different? After all the stuff he's done for you? should be ashamed of yourself. Just like you think they should be ashamed of their selves. Oh, but it's so easy to do that. I'm guilty. All of us are guilty. But all of this he's saying I'm going to do so that you know who I am. 
And that you also know that what I promised to Abraham as part of a covenant, that I keep my promises and I keep my covenants. I said to him that I would take his descendants and bring them back to the land, and I will. Guess what? You know why we get to go back to the land? Because that's still part of the promise that has not yet truly been fulfilled. That is why we get to go back. That is why we get to have the kingdom that's coming and we get to be a part of it. Because he still promised Abraham's descendants... And those that would be grafted in and consider themselves, we read those verses, right? If you are of Abraham's seed, you're part of the covenant. And those who are grafting in are to see themselves as Abraham's seed. If you follow Messiah, if you're covenanted to Yeshua and to Torah, etc. We read those verses last time. Then you should have confidence as being Abraham's seed. That means that the covenant is to bring you back to the land. By the way, that doesn't mean you have to get a plane ticket now to go fly to Israel. We're not talking about the land that the governments of this world established in 1948. We're talking about the Israel that Yahweh had established. And by the way, make no uh, confusions or illusions. The land that you see today does not have the right parameters and the right boundaries to match up with what Yahweh said anyway. Okay? So don't think it actually matches this. Now, the piece that we have is part of that, but it was bigger. Okay? Than what we see today. And so we don't even have the right boundaries, okay? So let's keep that in mind as we go through this. Yahweh uses the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to establish he, it is, uh, who he is, and, and uh, he is also the one who lays the groundwork here for the covenant at Sinai. That's what you're seeing here in Exodus 6. He wants to make sure he's laying out, you're going to learn, you're going to learn. You are going to learn. You know, I know parents say to a kid, you are going to learn. You're going to figure out who's really in charge here, you or me. You know, you get that re rebellious, rambunctious kid who wants to bang heads with dad. And dad says, oh, you could, you know, you, we'll, we'll settle that. You're going to learn. He says, Yahweh's saying here, you're going to learn. You're going to learn who I am and what that means and how you should be very afraid, but in a right reverent fear, like the fear of Yahweh teaching lays out. And you're going to have that awe and reverence that is appropriate for for the creator of the universe, a being that could lay waste to the greatest city in that, at that time in that area, okay, with the 10 plagues. I mean, just unbelievable things. Then the parting of the sea and all the other miracles and the pillar of fire, pillar of cloud, like, like that's an everyday event anybody would see, you know? And so... That relationship, he says, you're going to know. So let's remember that part of covenanting and part of going into covenant is that you're supposed to be going in. Now, remember, we don't covenant until Sinai. In that experience leading up to Sinai, those people should have known who they were dealing with. Okay? So the same thing we talk about in a marriage. I see too many people going to get married because they got all excited and they're all hormonal and they're all goo-goo-eyed and everything else, but they have really no idea what they're doing and they really don't even know the person they're marrying as well as they think they, they do or as much as they really should. They don't. Because it's after you get married, you're like, oh. Because every married couple, at some point I hear this, well, if I'd have known, well, why didn't you know? Because we don't go through that process right. See, Yahweh can never have, the Israelites could never say to Yahweh, if I'd have known. You can't even do it. It's all written out for you. You can't say, well, I wasn't there. Or not. Well, just read about it. It's all there. You can't say you didn't know who you're dealing with. But you act like it, though, when your boss says, I need you to work Saturday, you act like you don't know who you're dealing with. Because not only are you not afraid of the consequences of breaking the commandments, you're not trusting that he can provide you with something better. Because part of the covenant was that he would provide. And so are we really showing we know who we're dealing with when we act that way? And it always makes me laugh because so many of you are whining all the time how much you hate your job anyway. Until you're about to lose it. All of a sudden it's like, oh, I love my job. No, you don't. And couldn't he give you a better one? Ask around. I bet you there's a whole bunch of people even in this room that had that situation and Yahweh gave him a better one. Okay? Now, you maybe didn't get it right away. Maybe you had to suffer for a, for a small period of time waiting to get it. But you still were able to put bread on the table and have shelter 
and clothing on your back. I haven't heard anybody yet that suffered through all of that that you know, ended up with you know, literally not able to eat or sleep or be covered or anything. Oh, yes, you got into some debt and you struggled. You're always just trying to see how committed you are. If he did it for you instantaneously, you'd never learn to really trust him. So praise Yah, he doesn't you know, give you everything you need immediately. I know that's not fun to hear, but you should appreciate that, though. It's part of him testing you to see how serious are you. More to the point, how covenanted are you? How much do you actually trust fully that if you do your part, he'll do his? And that's the important piece of this, this puzzle here. Exodus 19. Now we're going to get there. You ready? Exodus 19. In verse 3. Okay, this is the foundational covenant for Israel and all who would join Israel in the future. This is the foundation right here. Exodus 19 and in verse 3. And Moses went up to Elohim and Yahweh called to him from the mountain saying, this is what you are to say to who? Christians? Jews? No. The house of Yaakov and declare to the children of Israel, which we read in the promises would be scattered everywhere and be even including the Goyim. Okay? Because remember, the promises made to Abraham, which was that he'd be the father of many Goyim, got passed to Isaac and to Jacob. He said, this is what you're going to declare and what you're going to say to Yah, the, child, the house of Yaakov, the children of Israel. By the way, notice that this is a covenant with who? The house of Israel. Is that not exactly what you also read in Jeremiah 31 when we get to verse 33 and it says, and it's going to be with the house of Israel. Okay, so he's renewing this. Very simple, very logical, not complicated. He says, you have seen what I did to the Mitrites. You have seen what I did to the Mitrites and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. And now, okay, you ready? Here's the covenant. And now if you diligently obey my voice. By the way, that's, that's our whole obligation. There's, there's no more small print. That was it right there. If you diligently obey my voice and shall guard my covenant, which is simply done by obeying his voice, then you shall be my treasure possession above all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a reign of priests and a set-apart nation. Those are the words you are to speak to the children of Israel. By the way, when he says a reign of priests, in this context, it's what, what priests are he ta- is he talking about? Melchizedek priests. I'm not talking about Levitical priests here. You're going to be a reign of priests, like the one that Abraham sat down with. Okay? Melchizedek priests. He says, you're going to be a reign of priests and a set-apart nation. Those are the words you are to speak to the children of Israel. All right? In verse 7, Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all the words which Yahweh commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, listen now, all that Yahweh has spoken we shall do. All that Yahweh has spoken. Now, Yahweh hadn't said anything yet, except you've got to agree to do everything I say. All the things that he wants us to do and don't do come after we agree. Because it's not based on what. I'm not asking the question like it's not based on what. what. I'm saying it's not based on the what. Okay? You're not deciding to keep or not keep, to covenant or not covenant, because you like or don't like what's in the contract. You're doing it because you trust the simplicity of, if you diligently obey my voice and guard my covenant, I will take care of everything else. And therefore, it doesn't matter the what. Oh, well, if I didn't know that I couldn't eat you know, shellfish. Well, I love shrimp, you know. Then, well, no, he doesn't want to put anything in there that you could argue with or anything in there that you can say, well, I really don't like that or I, I don't agree with that. No, simple. Are you going to trust me enough to just do everything I say and knowing that I will bless you, keep you safe, and change you into what you need to be? That's why he doesn't tell them anything till after they agree. Do you see the beauty of that? That way there's nothing in the after, all the details, that they could really argue about. He says, oh, no, you can't argue. You agreed no matter what I say. 
If I, if I told you to lay on your side for a year or to eat a scroll or do whatever, you agree to just do whatever I say. We had some prophets had to do some weird things. But they demonstrated that they would do whatever he said, no matter how strange that might be. I want you to walk around this giant walled city. Just walk around it. Oh, by the way, do that tomorrow again and the next day and the next day for seven days. What? Yep, I want you to just walk around the city. <laughs> do you think they figured that if they did that, the walls would fall? Now, you know about that already. I wish, if I, if I could have a, not like if I only had one wish, but if I had a wish, one wish I would have was, I wish I could read the scripture from scratch not knowing what happened. I can't remember what that was like and what it must be like to wonder the Egyptians are behind them, the water's in front of them. What's going to happen? What is that like to be? I mean, we all know what happened. So it's not, you don't get that same awe and like, you know, even as a kid, you don't have that because you probably saw the movie before you ever read the book. So you already know what happened. But just to be able to sit there going, wow, I didn't see that coming. That's incredible. I mean, what are they doing walking around Jericho and then blowing shofars and yelling and screaming and all of a sudden then the walls come falling down? Nobody could see that coming. That's some really cool stuff. And so here he's going through this thing. He said, look, the people all said, all that Yahweh has spoken, we shall do. So Moses brings back that words back to Yahweh. And he says, okay, they agreed. They agreed. Now, he does say, look, not only do you have to diligently obey, but you have to guard, guard the commands. Guard the commands. I'm sorry, there was a little rap thing that somebody made of one of my things one time, okay? But we don't really understand that word either. I have to make a teaching. Marty will have to remind me to do a teaching on guarding at some point because we don't like to understand what it means to guard the commands. Oh, we, we, we understand a little bit about keeping well, I'm supposed to keep the Torah, keep the commands, keep the Sabbath. But it says guard. You know, one of the times in one of, you know, you got Exodus and you got Deuteronomy where you got the commandments laid out, the Ten Commandments. One of them says, remember, the other says guard. You got to guard the Sabbath day. What does that mean to guard? He wants you to guard. I want you to picture that military person standing there with his, you know, or AR or AK or whatever he's got or his sword. Well, I don't care if you want to look at an old medieval looking one or a brand, you know, modern day one, but they are standing guard, which means you are got to get through me or kill me before you get to that thing. Are you guarding the commands with basically, you know, if you don't kill me, I'm not doing it because you want you want me to, you know, you want to get to that thing that I'm guarding. You're going to have to kill me. Do you understand? That's guarding. Okay. If I put you in a guard post, you are going to stand there and guard unless you're dead. Is that not the military way? The only way you're not guarding it is if they kill you. But are we keeping commandments on that level? Are we guarding the commands? He says, I want you to guard my covenant. So he's making a covenant here. I want you to guard my covenant. You know, in Deuteronomy 26, okay, we'll get back to Exodus probably next time, but they'll go to Deuteronomy 26 just for a second because it's connected to this, all right? In Deuteronomy 26, we talk about, I want to show you a linkage to where things are fulfilled and things that are promised. So in Deuteronomy 26, and in verse 16, look what it says. This is where they're about to cross the Jordan, the, 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 the Arden, the Jordan River, and they're about to cross into the land. Look what he says. Today, Yahweh your Elohim is commanding you to do these laws and right rulings, and you shall guard and do them with all your heart and with all your being. That wasn't mentioned necessarily in Exodus 19, but we get to find that out pretty quickly, that guarding and saying, I'll obey, he wants us to do it with all our heart. So we get detail and clarification further into the covenant. But listen to this. He says, look, you shall guard and do them with all your heart and with all your being. You have today... Okay, so at that moment, you're about to go in the land. You today cause Yahweh to proclaim to be your Elohim and to walk in his ways and guard his laws. I think that's worded very badly. Basically, what he says is you have today declared that Yahweh is your Elohim and that you're going to walk in all his laws and you're going to walk in his commands and his right rulings and obey his voice. And Yahweh has caused it to be that you can now proclaim that he 
has, that you know that he has now chosen you as his people. See, so Yahweh says, this is now the fulfillment of Exodus 19. You are now walking into the land, which is the covenant and promise to Abraham, Abraham as, as well, Isaac and Jacob. He says, but this is now, you can now comfortably say, I am, I am obligated and covenanted. I'm obligated and covenanted to guard and keep the commands with all my heart and with all my being, and that I can claim to be that treasured possession, the people of Yahweh. See, we see that happening right here. He says, Yahweh has caused you to proclaim today to be his people, a treasured possession, as he has spoken to you, and to guard all his commands. Says it again, and to guard all his commands. So as to set you high above all the nations, which he has made for a praise and for a name and for an esteem, and for you to be a set-apart people to Yahweh your Elohim as he has spoken. Now, notice that all of that wonderful stuff is based on what? He's going to set you high above the nations, and he's going to do all these things as a praise, and he's going to give you all this honor and glory and all those other accolades. Why? He says, because you are guarding his commands and that you have set yourself apart. You're not like the other nations. You're not doing what they do. You have a contract and a relationship and a covenant. It's just like if I marry, when I married my wife, I set myself apart from all other women. She set herself apart from all other men. We have a contract. I hold her up in this high esteem above all the other women. She holds me up in this esteem above all other men. That's what Abba was saying here through, through the covenant thing. He says, I'm going to hold you up above all other suitors, all other peoples, all other nations, but it's because we have a covenant. We have a relationship. And in that relationship, you have agreed to trust me. By the way, most marriages struggle because they don't trust each other. And often with good reason because they've not been trustworthy. We don't have that problem with Yahweh. He has never, ever failed in his trustworthiness. Anybody want to argue with that? And so we don't have that problem in our, in our covenant with him. Now, as human beings, yeah, I'll, a lot of couples talk to me and say, oh, yeah, but, you know, she breached my trust. Oh, he breached, he breached my trust. And the person says, yeah, I did. So it's not like there's even an argument. They know they breached each other's trust. We don't have that problem here, except that we breach trust because we don't guard the commands. We don't obey the voice. We don't keep our side of it. And we're going to see as we get further down, guess what? There are consequences when we break the covenant. When we don't, remember, a covenant is, we talked about this here, that when the covenant is between Yahweh and mankind, there are conditions attached to the oath on the human side. And if the human party involved in the covenant does not keep the covenant's conditions, what was the covenant's conditions? Obeying his voice and guarding his covenant. That was it. And so if we don't keep that condition, guess what? There are consequences. And we're going to learn more about that in the next parts. We're going to close there today, a little bit shorter than usual by about five or ten minutes, which is fine. But just so hopefully we understand. This is what you signed up for. Okay? I know all of you when you were in church, you thought you were signing up for similar things. You, you were signing up for eternal life. That's really why, you, you know, everybody wants to live forever. Nobody wants to die. Nobody wants to suffer. So, I mean, really, that's why we're, we're signing up. And we'd like to have some of that happen in our life today. We don't want to wait for all of that. So we'd like to see some intervention and blessing and all that kind of stuff happening in our lives now. Deliverance from different things. That's why we signed up. But we don't understand is that really covenanting only works if you're going to trust him enough to obey his voice and to submit to all of his authority and to guard the commands. Guard the commands. Guard the commands. The guys who are laughing have heard the song. Okay, one of the guys in the group took some of my words and put them into music, and it was funny, like a rap song. Everybody now is going to say, I want a copy of that, I want a copy of that. We'll have to put that out there somewhere where you can get a copy of it, okay? But the point is, have you understood this? And if you have, have you taken it seriously? Or now that you know, are you going to take it seriously? Are you going to commit to it? Do you understand what you're dealing with? And we're just scratching the surface. We're only into, you know, barely out of Genesis and Exodus. And I've got, oh, I don't know, one, two, three, four, four more references just in Exodus that, by the way, will take us at least one whole part more just for that. We haven't even gotten through Exodus yet. We're still in the first two books. But I think that hopefully when we get through this, we'll have a different perspective. Let this be a wake-up call. 
Because guess what? Not only are you covenanted now, or are you at least hopefully trying to become part of that covenant, but you're practicing and rehearsing and preparing for the Jeremiah 3131 covenant, which will happen at the wedding feast. Don't go for this whole Christianity thing where we're in the new covenant now. It, well, there are lots of covenants. The one that Jeremiah is talking about, if we want to go back there just for a second, that one has not happened yet. How do I know? Because the next verse that we didn't get to read in verse 34, I believe, it's going to say in verse 34, uh, yeah, and no longer in this covenant to time, and no longer shall they teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother saying, no, Yahweh, for they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest. Is that true now? No. So then we're not there yet. Okay. Well, let's understand there are other covenant things we're going to see. There are covenants that have to do with what the priests were doing on Shabbat. Now, that's not a covenant between you and him. That was a covenant between the priests and him. So that, just remember, there's not just one covenant, but there's one that we call the covenant. Just like there's not one Messiah. Even Cyrus was a Messiah. If you look at the Hebrew, okay? Moses was a type of Messiah, and so, but there's one called the Mashiach, the Messiah. And there's a covenant that's known as the covenant. Just like we have a thing called the Ark of the Covenant. And the covenant is kept in that Ark, and a copy was made and kept outside of that Ark. The thing known as the covenant. And the covenant is going to be renewed in Jeremiah 31, 31. And that hasn't happened yet. But in the meantime, we can graft into the messed up, sort of broken, you know, kind of fragmented, you know, covenant that Yahweh's never changed, but the people have handled badly. Let's show him we really want to do that covenant. We want to obey his voice, and we want to guard his commands. And we're going to trust that if we do, everything will ultimately work out. That's it. But man, do we have trust issues. You have serious trust issues. Look, if you're dealing with people, people are terrible in terms of trust. So no wonder you have trust issues. You're dealing with human beings. Yahweh is not a human being. Yahweh has no trust issues that you should worry about. He does everything he says he will do, and you can bank on it, count on it, depend on it, period. And most of this book actually is to show you that. Just like we read in Exodus that what he said in Genesis, he did. Right? When he said he remembered the covenant promise he made to Abram. And then we read in Deuteronomy what he said in Exodus 19. He says, and this is, see, this is playing out. Now, of course, the obligation was in, De in Deuteronomy was that, hey, you would now go forward, go to the land, and you would guard and keep and obey. Now, of course, when they didn't, guess what? There was consequences. They got thrown out. So now we got to do the covenant again with the idea of, you know, okay, you broke it. Now we're going to have to fix this, you know, repent, make teshuvah, and get ourselves back into, in line with him so that we can get recovenanted. And that's what we're looking forward to, isn't it? Father, we come before you, and we are so looking forward to that renewing of covenant with you. And Father, we want to thank you, we want to praise you, and appreciate that you give us this book and the words so that we can know what has come before and that what is, what is coming in the future and that we can see what you have said and how what you've said has come to be. And so that we can build a relationship and a trust so that we can make the covenant of knowing that whatever you say, we should obey it because we can trust that obeying you brings blessing, safety, and transformation. So Father, we thank you so much for the words for the, for the, the, we thank you for the Jewish people guarding and, and keeping the book for us so that we can have it today to look at. For having that one tribe to stand and be available through time and take all of the slings and arrows and sufferings and everything else, <coughs> excuse me, so that we could have this book still available to us today. So, Father, we thank you. We praise you. We ask that you would truly help us to understand covenant how it differs from maybe what else we had in our minds. So just like a marriage, we can really understand what it means to be a bride and what it means to be the groom and what the obligations are and how you define those terms, not us. 
So, Father, we come before you asking that you would help us to be totally open to receive. Help us to have truly eyes and ears and hearts to receive and see and hear all that you have, not filtered through anything we had before, but unadulterated and clean and pure. So, Father, we thank you. We praise you and ask all that we ask in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Amen.